Okay, uh, we are recording. So I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am an instructional designer for MTSU Online. Um, and uh, with me today is Tara Perrin. She is one of the other instructional designers over at MTSU Online. Um, Tara is here not just because she's awesome and we love having her, but she is also the master at keeping things under control in the chat. So um, I tend to forget to look at the chat and answer questions as I go. So Tara, make sure that I do that. Um, and she is awesome at answering questions too um, that might be uh, quick links for you or information that she can get you that are resources that we have available. So make sure if you have questions, um, you can post those in the chat or um, you can flag me down. You can raise your little hand in Zoom or you can um, unmute yourself, whatever works for you. Um, we really like engaging conversations. So uh, whatever works for you works for us. So thank you, Tara, for being here today and for helping us out. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about gamification. Um, and specifically, we are going to be talking about how we um, build the gradebook and activity choices portions of gamification in D2L. Um, those are some of the things that we have these ideas of, oh, I'd love to be able to do this, but I don't know how to make D2L do it. Uh, one of the things about having instructional designers is that is part of what we do. Uh, we make D2L behave for you um, and we teach you how to make it behave. So, um, and yes, I did just give an inanimate object its own personifications. So it is its own thing. You know, at least one time, probably in the last week, you have told D2L how you felt about it. So we are really uh, aware of that situation because we do it sometimes too. So um, so really that's what we're here to do is just talk to you a little bit about that. Um, as we get going in this conversation, I'm gonna give you a little bit of history, um, not so much history, but a little bit of information about gamification and what it is uh, and how some of those concepts work with creating those choices and consequences and assessment activities and how those things work um, within a class because um, you can't really talk about how to do it without talking about why it's important to do it. Uh, so we're going to cover some of those things. Um, so I am going to actually go ahead and share my screen so that y'all can see um, my little presentation. Um, and our presentation today is in H5P um because we love h5p um it is fully um it's fully integrated into d2l uh, any faculty member on campus can have access uh, and if you want to know more about h5p there are videos on our channel um tara and scott hopped who's also on here somewhere um are experts at h5p um, I think you're experts. You're better than me. So yeah, expert. Um, and Tara actually has an H5P presentation next week, right? I think it's next week. Um, so if you have questions about it after you see this and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to do that, um, then come to that next week. Um, or you can always reach out to anybody in MTSU online um, or to Scott Hopped over in the LT and ITC. And we are happy to help you all with that. All right, so I'm going to share my screen so y'all can see it. Okay, um, I tried to increase it, uh, the font a little bit so that y'all could see it okay, but um, just so you can see what it actually looks like. Um, if you were a student, this all fits on the screen um, and these embed directly into D2L. So it makes for pretty cool activities right in the middle of D2L. Uh, so today we are talking about gamification and the gamification concept. Uh, we're going to cover eight topics today. Um, they kind of associate with those eight cute little things. Uh, one of the biggest things about gamification uh, and the concepts behind it are that gaming gives you choices as a student. Um, it gives you choices into how you access content, how you access information, how you participate in your own learning. So when you are looking at an activity within gamification, having multiple things to choose from and deciding what order you want to go in actually does engage you in your learning a little bit more than if it was just static and that you go here and then here and then here and then here. Um, we are by nature linear. That's who we are. We, we've learned how to read that way. We've learned how to engage with things that way. Um, but especially with newer, younger generations um, and the more that we 
uh, work with apps and we play online games and we order our groceries uh, on our phone and all of those things like that. We're much more engaged in a um, pop around to things as we see them or they interact with what we're thinking or what we want or what we know. Um, so these kind of concepts actually work really well um, and give students that opportunity to do things more in a pattern of the way that they're normally doing it. They still need to complete it. They still need to see it all, but they get to make choices as to the order that they go in, um, as to the type of resource that they pick. Um, so this one, um, this cute little image that we have here is actually an image hotspot in H5P. Um, so I'm gonna click um, around. I'll kind of show you what happens when you um, pop over these little plus signs, they pop up and tell you what's in that one. So. Hey, Dr. Uh, the first, yes. Can you scroll down just a tish since the bottom part is now cut off because it's scrolled or either that or zoom it out one more time. I'll zoom it out. So yeah, so it's not quite so big. Is that better? Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I, I never know where it needs to be in terms of that. So um, so we'll actually start here with learning and what it what is it? What is gamification? Um, so gamification, and here's your cute little pop-up, isn't it cute how that works? Um, it borrows from the techniques of the gaming world, uh, and it gives people the ability to interact with the, the different educational content. Uh, it really does create that level of motivation that I was just talking about, that they get to make those choices. Uh, and within that, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, it also really, really engages them in terms of inclusivity um and meeting students where they are so some diversity equity and inclusivity um concerns in terms of gamification because it it doesn't it doesn't do as much assuming that students know things because it gives us the opportunity to Im embed some background information um, it gives us a chance for students to use audio and video and text resources for their own learning needs based on their ways of learning and knowing. Um, so gamification really does allow for those different things to happen. Um, some basic examples are rewarding your students um, as they progress, um, offering badges, um, increasing the challenges with levels. Um, so that is one, um, if, if you think back you all probably took a standardized test, which is a whole nother issue in itself, but um, that they actually uh, got more difficult as you got things right. Like they have the AI in them so that they continue challenging you further and further and further as you're getting things correct. Gamification is actually part of that concept. And if you think about it in terms of a game that you play, like if you were to play an online game or you are um, an Xbox or PlayStation user, it gets more difficult as you go. Um, and then you get better rewards and you get more rewards as you go because things are more challenging. Uh, and you can develop that within your courses as well. Um, it provides background stories and narratives. Um, in some cases, you could do a leaderboard uh, within D2L and within um, classroom learning. We do have to be kind of aware about leaderboards because of FERPA and grading. Um, but if you are using something like badges in your class, you can actually portray those. They're in the class and students can see that people are getting them. Um, so you can actually set that up so that people can see awards that people are getting, but not actually see grades. So you can get around some FERPA things with things like that. Um, and then it allows for graphics um, and engagement through things that are visually appealing for the student. Um, so that's a little bit about what gamification is. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the brain. Um, so we're gonna look at skill in the brain and why gamification is effective. Um, so, uh, and you'll get, by the way, I'm going to share this entire H5P with you. Um, and so you'll get this and you'll get all of these links. Um, but some of the things to think about in terms of gamification, um, have you, any of you, and you don't feel like you have to raise your hand, but have you ever been in a presentation that you were just sitting in a room and the person at the front of the room was talking at you um, with a PowerPoint that had all the words that you feel like have ever been invented all on every slide? 
and you just are not able to really connect with what they're saying or what they're doing. Um, I have been in situations like that. I assume other people have. Um, so one of the things about gamification is that it actually creates an opportunity for you to feel an emotional connection with the learning. Um, I don't, I don't know that I always felt an emotional connection with classes that I was taking. Um, I'm not sure that my students always feel an emotional connection with classes that I teach. Um, but because they get to make some of those choices, they get to um, have reactions to the things that they're doing, it really does make that impact for them emotionally. So it kind of hits their affective domain. Um, so in the whole understanding the brain better, I don't have a background in science, but the hippocampus that controls our recall. So if we interact with something in, a, in multiple ways, then it actually creates those opportunities for us to recall things in a better way. So emotional connections, multiple ways of recall. Um, dopamine, if we're having fun, we remember it. Um, I talk about this sometimes that we forget um, what it was like to not know. Um, and I also talk about that we make assumptions sometimes that um, it's our knowledge void. We make assumptions that people know things because we know things. Um, and so within that, one of the, the things that I use is the um, and or and not within when you're doing research for library research um, and not knowing that. And my example with that is, did anyone teach you um, do you remember when you were taught that in high school, did it seem like a meaningful event to remember how to do that? Or if you're my age, we didn't have computers for doing any kind of research. Um, so we didn't learn that in high school. Um, so it's not something that you're going to remember because it didn't have an impact. So if it doesn't have an impact, we're not as likely to keep it up in there, um, keep it in our brain and keep it processing. Um, so it's really about making those connections that cause students to want to remember. It causes students to want to learn more. Uh, they want to know more about a thing because it created that moment for them. I'm, I'm sure y'all have ended up in a, a YouTube wormhole um, that you watch a video and then the next one pops up, you're like, well, now I'm going to have to watch that one. And you accidentally learn. Um, gamification is notorious for accidental learning because people get excited about the information and it creates questions in them because they're paying attention at a slightly different level. Um, so you'll have to check out this link after y'all get this and read a little bit more about um, some of the stuff that how it actually impacts the, the brains and why it is that that we enjoy it. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about user engagement. Um, so this one, um, this one for me is really where I can get off on a huge big tangent. Um, and it's where we start talking about our content and thinking about UDL. Um, UDL is universal design for learning. Uh, and it are, it are, hey college, what's up? Um, it is uh, a set of principles that, that promote students, uh, meeting students where they are for their learning. Uh, instead of, of us standing at the front or uh, making decisions about how a student's going to learn, um, we are instead creating opportunities for them to pick how they learn. So it's really the whole concept of gamification. It's the whole concept of accessibility and inclusion. It really promotes DEI. It really promotes uh, accommodations because it gives the information in ways that students get to choose with flexibility how they interact with it. Um, the three primary concepts are engagement, representation, and action and expression. So engagement, how they engage, what they engage with, the level of engagement that they have with the resource or with the content or with the information. Um, so thinking about that, um, if you are reading an academic article and it has all this information in it and you're, you're in, in that zone and you're processing with it and you're getting what it says. As faculty members, we read a lot of academic articles, articles so we're a little bit better at it than some people, um, but it's one way of, of gathering that information. If you were given the choice between an academic article and a three minute video that explained the same thing, you might 
depending on what you were doing, especially if it wasn't something you were doing for your own research, watch the video because it's three minutes long and they're going to explain a 15 page article to you in three minutes. Well, that is actually, you're still learning about it. You're still getting the information. It may be a more baseline information instead of all of the detail, but it gives you that choice as to what you're looking at. Or maybe you listen to a podcast um, or, or when you learn something, when you actually do it, uh, then it tends to commit to your memory a little bit more. So we watch a video and then we actually do the thing. We watch a video about how to make cupcakes from scratch. Uh, and then we go and make cupcakes from scratch. We're going to remember it from making the cupcakes a little bit better than just watching a video on it. And so some of us learn really well from reading. Some of us learn really well from auditory opportunities. And some of us learn really well from doing things. We don't know how our students best process information. And the way we process information may not be the way that's best for them. So UDL is a concept about providing those platforms and opportunities for students to control their own level of learning, uh, their own way of, of looking at material. That fits right in with representation and that their way of learning and knowing is available within their course. Um, and it's there to begin with. Um, when when we get that email from the DAC that says there's somebody in your course that has an accommodation and this is how we need to address that. If we have already been thinking about UDL, then we are already in that space that accommodation really isn't going to take quite as much work. Our videos are already captioned. Uh, we have different types of resources available uh, in our classes for them. Um, we may have to adjust some timing on some things, but we've really created those opportunities for students to meet the learning where they are, and we are promoting that. It's not changing your teaching necessarily. It's not changing the information that you're giving. It's making sure that the student can get to that information in a way that best represents them. Uh, it also does allow for some additional awareness with DEI because uh, UDL does promote a lot more opportunities and there are some things out there about how some types of information are very leaning towards one way or the other. So um, finding some of those other opportunities for uh, representation is really a positive in terms of UDL. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because I know I've kind of already covered like a whole bunch of stuff. So everybody's still doing okay. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pop us in to um, how about we go goals. So we're going to go to goals. Um, I'm not actually going to make us watch this video right now, but it's a pretty great video. Um, so the, the thing about goals, um, the goals area within this, um, it's, a, it's about how we make um, gamification, there you go, um, gamification and uh, participation in their own learning. So it's right back in line with that UDL. It's right back in line with those opportunities. But the big thing about it is that it gives people the opportunity to fail. Um, it gives them the freedom to make mistakes. If we're looking at things within our courses and everything in our course is required and everything in the course is, is required at an exemplary level to get to uh, the highest grade in the class, then we're not giving students much room to make mistakes. Uh, we're not giving them much room to experiment. Education is about learning. It's about teaching and learning and gathering information and going to the next level and going to the next level and getting better and better and better as we progress down those paths. If everything in our class is required for a minimal level of success, students will instinctively go into your class with a little bit of anxiety and fear. Um, if everything in the class is high stakes, they go into everything in that with that anxiety and that fear. If we can set things up in a way that allows for our students to look at different activities, uh, different ways of getting those assessments to a certain skill level or to a certain point level, 
then they also can embrace their own comfort. We need to push and challenge them in some ways, but they will be able to make some choices about when and how they want to do some different activities within the class. Um, of course, some things would be mandatory, but um, letting them make some of those choices is really what you wanna look for. Um, so I'm gonna click us over to D2L. So if you would like to log into your D2L, if you have a sandbox um, or a place that is a hidden that you want to take a look at some of these things and maybe add some things, you're welcome to. Um, I'm fine if y'all minimize me down the corner. Um, so in, um, in D2L, um, when we go into this course, um, when we are looking, let's see, look, reuse of images, memory. Um, so when we look into this and we start looking around at, at different ways that we can create opportunities for students to have different types of um, learning activities, resources, ways that they can make their own choices about the things that they participate in, um, I want to show you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about and what that might look like. Um, so connecting with the UDL, but also just with life in general. Um, so within this one, there are three um, different resources. There's a video, there's a podcast, and there's a link. Uh, they all talk about the basics of gamification uh, right there in the class. So you could choose any one of those or all three of them to look at um, or to listen to because that's choosing what works best for you. Do you want to read it? Do you want to watch it? Do you want to hear it? Um, so really thinking about that. It didn't take a whole lot of time for me to add all three of those resources, but it kind of creates that opportunity for students to pick. But the part I want to talk about about them choosing how they're going to do an assessment um, is in, in the introduction discussion right here. Um, so if you look at it, it's just an introduction. Hey, do this, have a little conversation. But right down here in the very last part in that bottom sentence, it says you can write your introduction, record a podcast, or use D2L video note tool with the link in instructions. So what I've done in that moment is given students that opportunity to choose how they interact with each other. If they want to write, that's great. Have at it. Type away. Um, it does mean that you can't post in that parent Facebook later about that we made you write something and then respond to two people. Um, it means that you get to make a choice about how you're engaging with, with each other. Some people really love to do videos. And by some people, I mean me. I am extremely extroverted. I have zero issues in front of a camera. I am like, yeah, let's do it. I embrace with all that I am that most people in the world are not like me. Um, so not everybody wants to do a video. They may feel more comfortable doing a podcast uh, or they may feel more comfortable typing it out. One of the things to think about with that, with in the introduction, I may say that you have a choice, but by the end of the semester, I may actually have it so that you have to do at least one of those. In one discussion throughout the semester, you're going to have to do a video. In one discussion throughout the semester, you're going to have to do a podcast. So you can decide when it is that you're gonna do those. And that's where you start thinking about the student choice and the consequences of those choices and how those can impact their overall decisions with learning. If you're afraid of doing a video in the very first week of class, don't feel like you have to. But by the end of the semester, you're going to have to. If you wait until the last discussion of the semester, it might not be a topic that you're super excited about doing a video on. So as long as we're upfront and honest that at some point in the semester, they're going to need to use the video tool um, or some other video thing, they get to make a choice as to when they are doing that. If they are not thinking about the fact that they're going to have to do it at some point down the road and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait, then a topic or a concept that they're not as comfortable with is the one they're going to end up doing the video on, which makes that video a little bit more of a test for them. Um, it creates kind of a different level for them. So in the in our description, we talked about consequences. That's the kind of consequences that we're talking about, um, is that thinking about, I'm gonna have to do this. When is it that I want to do it because it's in my best interest to do it? Do I wanna get that done in the introduction that has a little bit less 
stress um, or do I not want to get it done in the introduction because it's the very first day of class and I'm freaked out. Um, so really allowing yourself to make some of those choices. Uh, one of the other um, activities I wanted to show you is a way that you can easily do this within your um, course content is um, within the Dropbox uh, here, within our assessments, within our Dropbox. So there's one right here and it's it's not super filled out. So I'll show you what it looks like, but it's pretty basic. Um, when you go in and you edit the folder and you take a look at it, um, it just says module one submission. So in that, what I am suggesting is that they pick an infograph, an article review, a video or podcast production, or other type of activity um, that they think best fits. And that's where they submit it. So I'm not making them do a presentation. I'm not making them do an article review on this topic. I'm not making them do an infographic. I am asking them to choose one of those things to submit within here. So the really awesome thing about that is that um, not everybody is great at uh, writing articles or doing article reviews or, or typing things out. Um, and you know what? That's okay. Um, everybody doesn't have to be an expert at it. Um, and everyone that comes into our courses is not going to go on and be um, a, have a doctorate someday. Um, some people are going into areas and future professions that some of these other types of assessment activities actually better meet their future goals and needs. If I was going to be an instructional designer, um, then it would actually make sense for me to practice infographics. Uh, if I am somebody who is going into uh, recording industry, then maybe doing a, a podcast would be a great way for me to practice some of those things in my other classes. So not only does it create an opportunity for them to look at the resources and the information and the content within that module, but then they also get to make choices about how they are then synthesizing that information and presenting it back to you in their response. Um, it doesn't it's, it's not a, a memory recall of a test. It's not a, uh, a fully developed APA 10-page um, paper. It's about figuring out where they need to create that activity, um, that assessment activity, so that you can review that they are getting the information and the content, but they're also learning other sets of skills that will take them further into their career. Um, I'm one of those people that uh, typically when I have in a class that I have things like this, I tell them that at some point in the semester, they're going to end up doing all, all of them. So just start thinking about early which one you want to do when. Um, but there's always more submissions than there are those options. So they'll be able to do a couple of them a couple times if they would like to. Uh, and they really find one that speaks to them. Um, I don't know how many of you have created your own podcast uh, or have created an infographic or things like that. But a lot of those things, you really have to very much focus on the information and know what you're talking about before you create what that thing is. Um, sometimes we can hide things. If, a, if we have a 10 page paper, we can hide some things in that 10 page paper. If we have to get all of that information on a 11 by 17 infographic, then that creates a, a much greater understanding of what that content is about. Um, does anybody have any questions about choice of type of activity? Okay, I am, I need to move us. Okay, um, so the next one I wanted to talk about, um, I think we've already actually covered this one, but I'll show you all the cute little image because it's fun. Um, it's about the trying again and providing um, students with the opportunities uh, to fail uh, and to make those choices and to experiment with things. You know, when we are playing a game, um, whatever kind of game that is, um, if, if we if we die off in the game, we at some point are given more lives, whether that's based on time has passed and, and our little hearts are renewed um, or uh, we uh, in somewhere in the, the activity, oh, we beat this, this thing at this huge beast and we got all kinds of rewards from doing that um, or we get one more chance from doing it. Um, 
giving them that chance to fail is really hugely important. And a lot of that comes from feedback too. Um, it's not always right and wrong necessarily. And maybe if they epically fail at the first time that they submit an activity or an article, um, giving them the opportunity to resubmit it, they're going to go back and they're really going to learn that material. They're going to go back and they're really going to focus on what it is that they were supposed to have gotten the first time through. Um, and that kind of goes back to, you know, hitting our recall. We're more likely to remember it if we visited it more than once. Um, it really is going to make more connections the more we do it. So if somebody doesn't knock it out of the park the first time, that's okay. Um, let them take that opportunity to revisit and relearn and refocus on what it is. Um, there do have to be times that there are limits to that. We cannot keep our classes open for three years while they keep redoing things. There, there is a point, but if we're giving solid feedback and we're providing them with that information, we're asking those additional questions, we're prompting them in the way that they need to go, then it's not going to take more than another time maybe two, uh, but it's not going to take all semester to figure, figure out something because you have been guiding them in how to do it better. Um, and that's super duper important, I think, in any kind of class, but also especially in um, online classes where we don't see students face to face. Um, when we are in a synchronous environment with our students, if they don't understand something or they're uh, confused by something or something that doesn't make sense, you actually see them like do the little head tilt and like maybe one eyebrow up or um, like, I don't understand. Like you actually physically see them doing it. Sometimes in online classes, we don't get to see that. Uh, and they don't always feel confident reaching out and asking us for that extra information um, or for that extra help. So that's really where it's our responsibility to guide them through that learning. Um, you may not have needed that to the same level um, in all of the the topics that you may have covered when you were coming through school. Uh, there's probably something that didn't always stick quite right. Um, but really thinking about the fact that you have to remember where they are in the process, not where you are in the level of knowing and really helping them get to that next space so that they're building on that information and they're scaffolding those resources and they're getting to that next level. Okay, so I think that some of you are here to learn how to make your grades work with gamification. So we're actually gonna build that. Um, so I'm going to show y'all what that looks like and how we go about building grades within our courses using gamification. Um, one of the concepts that, that I do with that and one of the big concepts with gamification, yes, it's about active learning. Yes, it's about student engagement. Yes, it's about those things. It's about the choices they make to get to that final grade. Um, and that's really kind of at the foundation of gamification is part of that students making that choice and that selection. How do we do that in, in, in a D2L grade book? Because the D2L grade book isn't instinctively set up to work that way. So I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. Um, you're also going to see in this um, that our student in this class has not been participating fully. Um, it's Tara. I added her this morning. So she has not been participating in the class well. Y'all will see that she's not doing good. <laughs> okay, so back here in our classroom, I am just gonna go to grades and I've already set it up for you, but I'm actually gonna uh, walk you through the process just a little bit so that you see it. Um, so this is this is what it looks like. I'm gonna switch it to standard view because I, I don't know how I got there, but it makes it weird. So if any of you are in your own D2L classes and you're kind of, you've popped over to a grade book in a class, um, please make sure you don't change the grade book in an active class. Please use the sandbox or something closed. Um, so you will see that um, here is my student. Thanks, Tara. Um, and then here is one of the things that is probably different for you. Um, than it is in this class. So what D2L's default is set for that to be a repeat of the calculated grade. Now, if you take this and you scroll way over here to the other side, here is my final calculated grade. 
and then it's my final adjusted grade. I actually repeat uh, in a class that I'm doing full on gamification, I actually repeat my final adjusted grade. And that is because the D2L grade book, when you add all those things in, you know how it calculates it for you and it gives you your total number and then you go figure out your grade chart and your syllabus based on the final number that D2L gave you, or at least you hope the two match. Um, when you're using gamification, you're gonna switch it because you still have all of those points in your grade book. But for this one, I only need my students to get to 500 points to get an A. Uh, that's as far as I need them to get. But if we look at my managed grades, there are actually 750 points available in my class. So by changing where they view it and the part that they view to be the adjusted grade, they will see how they're doing in terms of getting to that 500. So instead of 750, I only need them to get to 500. And I am giving them choices as to what it is that they're completing. Which activities in this class are you going to finish to get to that 500 points? Now you'll see that there's a category here on my manage grade page that says mandatory. Um, you call it mandatory, you can call it required, whatever you wanna do. But there are things within a class that I don't give the students a choice as to whether or not they complete them. They're going to complete these. Now there are probably choices within each of those things as to how they go about completing it. But for me, some of these things are required. Um, within a course, uh, especially with an online course, uh, we really need our students engaging with each other, not just because we want them to learn the content, we want them to know things and we don't want it to be a correspondence class, but cycling back a little bit to that DEI thing that we were talking about a little bit earlier, we learn from the perspectives of others, the ways that other people view information, portray that information and connect it with their own experiences helps us as individuals become better global citizens and learners. So having discussions in your classes um, online or face-to-face -face, is vital for that. It's vital for that student learning. It's vital for us as educators and it's vital for them becoming more aware of their, uh, their own world, their own perspective, their own limitations, their unconscious bias, uh, all of those things that we want to touch on, the more interaction that our students have with each other, in addition to us and the, the content in the class, the more well-rounded that information is, the better the connection it is with that learning. Um, so I make discussions in my classes required. Um, there are other things where they get to make some choices. Um, so for example, in this class, if you only had to get to 250 points um, and the, these activities right up here don't add up anywhere near to the 500 points, I mean, they're, they're getting there, but they're not quite all the way to the 500 points. But holy moly, if you wanted to do a group project, you would be halfway to your final grade if you did a group project. In a real class, I don't know that I would make a group project half. <laughs> but this is just an example to show you really in terms of choices um, and how students can choose to get to the end. So if they wanted to do that group project, you think you get up to 250 points they're probably not going to get the full 250, but you're going to be headed closer to a greater number of points to your final goal. Making that choice, not everybody wants to work in groups. Um, not everybody does well in groups. Uh, some people really may not want to participate in a group activity. That's okay. Some people love group activities. As I mentioned earlier, the extrovert in me, I'm a big fan of group activities, but I know that not everybody is. Uh, so if the student chooses to do the group activity, but then they make the decision way late in the semester that they're gonna do it, that means that at the end of the semester, uh, when they're doing all of their final projects and all of their group projects and presentations for every other class, they're trying to scrounge around and get that extra 250 points at the end. Uh, if they make the choice to do the group project and get those 250 points closer to the beginning of the semester, they've knocked out a major part of their class before fall break or before spring break. Um, you know, so they're taking that opportunity to really look and focus on 
where they are in terms of this class and where they want it to go. Um, so you choose to do it now, you've knocked all that out and you're well on your way to, to getting what you need uh, to get an A in this class. And you're making the choice as to how you get there. If you're not thinking about it and you're putting things off till the end, you're gonna be bombarded with information at the end. Um, if they're procrastinators like me, I mean, maybe they thrive better under that, uh, but that's not really where learning happens when we try to pack things in at the end. Um, it is also really helpful for things like this. We've talked a little bit about uh, inclusivity and accommodations and accessibility and, and information like that um, because gamification is so good for those concepts. Um, a lot of people have test anxiety, a lot. Um, and a lot of that test anxiety comes from exams and tests being so high stakes and you having one shot at it. Um, and so people go into it and end up actually not doing as well because they're so anxious that they are second guessing themselves uh, and they're, they're making poor decisions in terms of what the answers are because they're just overwhelmed by those sensations and those feelings. So maybe exams aren't required. Uh, if somebody wants to take them, okay, um, more power to you. Um, but if they really don't want to take them, would it be possible for them to successfully complete your course doing other types of activities? Uh, can they get there by showing you that they are accomplishing those learning outcomes and those learning objectives uh, and getting the information that you're conveying to them in the class, can they get there in ways other than an exam? If we have people that have test anxiety, how else can we encourage them to take that information and apply that information and move forward with that information without it being a test? I'm not saying that tests are all bad. I'm giving you options. Uh, or if we have tests and exams, um, maybe not one shot deals. Um, do they get more than one attempt? Um, are they lower stake? So instead of 300 point exams making up um, a huge portion of your course grades, um, could the exams, could we have more that are each one is worth fewer points? Um, if they're cumulative, do they have a choice in whether or not they complete them? Do they have more than one, one attempt at them? Really looking at ways the students can make that choice in their own learning and their own assessment so that they're making those connections and information on their own. This is usually where people have questions. So I'll go into a, a little bit more about how to create this, but does anybody have questions at this point? Or am I just overwhelming y'all with content? And you're like, oh my God, it's so much. Okay. So if you are getting ready to set up um, a, a grade book using gamification, there is this cute setting over here on the far right side that's the little cog that says settings. Um, there's a couple things in there that you're gonna wanna take a look at. Um, and the biggest one is right down here at the bottom of the personal display options part, uh, making sure that you have repeated um, the adjusted final grade. That's important. Um, you can look at what is also available in the other areas. Um, I think it's helpful to allow people to know how the grade was calculated. And then here, here's one of the things. Some people really like weights. Um, weights are, are just putting a cool symbol after a number. Um, you can do that with points um, without it being weighted. And weighted is, in, in my opinion, in, in Kim land, weighted is much harder to do gamification um, because it you have to start thinking about percentages of areas to add up to your total number of points instead of just total number of points. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, and then also, drop ungraded items because your students are all coming in with zero and their goal is to get to 500. It doesn't do any good for the ungraded items to be treated as zero because it, they won't get to the number because things will keep. It just 
creates a weird way of looking at it. it still works mathematically the same it just looks different um so i say drop the ungraded items so those are the areas that you want to look at in terms of settings we didn't change anything but it always asks you because d2l doesn't want you to make something mad um so back in grades we are going to do the setup wizard um and i don't know how many of you use the setup wizard but the setup wizard is cool um, it will go through some of these things, ask you what you want. You just click start. Um, I am a points person. Uh, I explained why. This is where I want to, my final grade released. I use the adjusted final grade. And then you continue. Um, I, I want to drop my ungraded items. And I want to keep my final grades updated because that's where it will continually add for them as they're getting more points. Percentages is fine. There are a whole bunch of options, but percentage is the one that is in there and you can just leave that as it is. The decimal points are fine. This is where I start really kind of thinking about how I want this to make sense for students. I want them to see the points grade. I do not use this symbol or the color. I don't know if y'all have ever noticed the color in D2L, but it's actually based on that grade level. Um, so you know, if they have a blue, it's an A. If they have a green, it's a B. A yellow is a C. Um, there's a orangish, reddish color that's a D. And then uh, the red, is failing. Um, I, I don't want them to have that color because that color gives them that false information because if they only have 500 out of 700 points, they're actually not doing very well in the class according to the structured final grade. Uh, according to my concept of grades, they're doing great. Uh, they're already there. They, they finished it all. Yay, go team. Um, so that's just one of the things that I suggest that you change. Uh, and then you finish and set up and it sets it up and it makes it look like our grade page um, where Tara has 500 points that she needs to get um, and she's just going to need to step it up because she's she doesn't have much time left in the semester and she hasn't gotten any points yet. Um, so here are how it shows them how they're getting to that point. And it will continue to add over here for them. Their view is a little bit different. When you view it as a student, it looks different. Um, but they'll be able to see their points. They'll be able to see it adding up to that 500. They'll know how close they are. Of course, in your syllabus or somewhere in the class, you need to make sure that you're explaining how that um, grade structure happens. What is an A? What is a B? What is a C based on that 500 points? Um, and what does that look like? Um, of course, somebody can get more than 500 points. They just get a better A, but you got to have at least 500 to get an A. Now, it may take somebody in your class the entire semester completing every single thing in the class to get to that 500 points. So maybe in, in our way we've been taught with grading, that means that that individual probably deserves a C. Um, if it's the traditional form of grading, but in our class, that student is getting an A. Um, that is because that student actively worked at completing every single one of those things in the class. They're walking away with a greater set of knowledge and ability. They may not have been 100% in every one of these categories, but they really did commit to their own learning to complete every one of those activities. They failed a few times but they kept going and they kept going and they got there. Um, so it's a, it's a really different way to think about grading. Um, if y'all have been through any of the presentations that the LTNIT has done, LTNITC has done in terms of ungrading, you're gonna run into some of what does that look like and, and what are some of those structures, um, but it's about how your student is getting to that 500 points. Um, so that is how you set up when you go to grade them. Obviously, you just go in and you click grade. You give a grade to the person. And you give them that information and then it will show up. Um, so. Does that make any sense? Anybody? Everybody got it? Everybody's ready to go, right? Yay. Um, so I know that that was quite a bit um, in terms of what grades look like, but it really is 
you got to set it up first. You have to set it up before you structure your class. It cannot be one of those things that you go in and add as you go, as you're creating your drop boxes and your discussions, because it'll kind of mess you up. Um, so create that grade first. It's faster that way anyway. <laughs> when you're tying things in the in your drop boxes and in your discussions, if it's already in grades, it's faster anyway. So um, just think about those things as as you are developing the class. Um, but that is what a completely gamified grade book looks like, that it's about that student choice and they're making the options, whether or not they are completing an activity for their own learning, because you have way more stuff in the class uh, and in the grade book than they would need to complete. So they can make choices about their own learning and how they're applying that learning. Okay, um, I think that we have touched on just about, here's our references. They'll be right here when y'all are ready to look at them. Um, and then this one, I'm gonna show you what it'll look like. So here in just a little bit in your D2L, cause I'm gonna go manually give it to you. Um, here in a little bit in your D2L, you're gonna get a badge because you, came today. So I'm rewarding you for participating in our gamification workshop. Um, and I'm sure it's all makes perfect sense to you. Um, so the, the one additional little piece of information I can give you about gamification, um, try not to feel overwhelmed by it. It's a lot. I've been doing gamification for like 10, 10 or 12 years. Um, and there are still things in it that I'm like, what? Um, so please do not feel like you have to implement everything at once. Think about one or two areas that you might want to try. If you are interested in setting up a grade book um, and looking at your activities in terms of how you could set those up, um, possible ideas of ways that you can do that, feel free to reach out to any of us. Feel free to reach out to Scott or anybody over in the FITSI, uh, and they are also happy to talk to you about how to do that. We can walk you through it, uh, and you are also going to have this video um, and this resource uh, for you to take a look at, too, if you have questions when you get ready to set it up. So we just don't want you to feel like you're doing it alone, and we're here to help you with it. Um, there's also videos out there on how to create badges in D2L so that um, you can see how to set those up to reward your students as they complete things. Uh, we can talk to you about how you can create those in terms of crediting and things like that for students to actually be able to have a leaderboard too. So we've got all kinds of things we can talk about with it. Um, so um, I am going to stop my screen share um, and then see if anybody has any questions. The chat has been very quiet, um, which either means I was very clear or I said way too much and y'all are very confused. Um, either I feel like it's possible. So um, so I've stopped the screen share uh, and I'll actually go ahead and stop the recording so that if y'all wanna ask any questions, we're here. Um, it's almost two o'clock, but we, we'll stay for a while, don't worry. So Kim, it's Kathleen. 